Edward Lee was a charismatic but a difficult personality. We had some difficulty in analyzing him. All of us agreed that uh, a Corfield, Dr. Anthony Stevens, notable author and psychiatrist, would be the most appropriate person to do that. Dr. Stevens, the chair is yours. Thank you very much, Spiro. This exhibition is an entirely Greek initiative, funded by the three great cultural foundations of this country, the Levendis, Bolosakis, and Kostopoulos. I can't help thinking how delighted and touched Lear would have been if he could have known that Greece, the country that he loved so much, would uh, celebrate his bicentenary by organizing a magnificent display of his works on Corfu, the island that he loved most of all islands in the world. This Hellenic appreciation of his genius is in contrast to the reputation he sometimes had to endure from his own countrymen. He tells a story that when he was on a painting trip in Calabria on the toe of Italy, he overheard two Englishmen talking about him over breakfast at their hotel. And one of them said, do you know who that chap was we had we, we, we were talking to last night. Well, you know, he, he's nothing but a dirty landscape painter. <laughs> well, this bit of arrant snobbery, of course, upset Lear, but the way in which he dealt with it was extremely characteristic of him. Instead of sort of going quiet about it and repressing it, as I think most of us would have done, he broadcast it. And he referred to himself always after that as the dirty landscape painter. Now, as we shall see, Leo was a troubled and highly complex character. And self-mockery was one of the techniques he used in making light of things that he was ashamed of. In attempting to uh, examine the psychology of somebody who's been dead 124 years, one has to be something of a Sherlock Holmes, as well as a Freud, or a Jung, or an Adler. One has to read the biographies, the letters, the diaries. One has to examine the works that the subject produced. Fortunately, in the case of Edward Lear, we have enough material to provide us with some, at least, of the material uh, that we need in order to do this work of psychological detection. Edward Lear was born in Holloway, which was then a village on the outside, on the outskirts of London, on May the 12th, 1812. He was the 20th of 21 children, produced by Jeremiah Lear, a stockbroker, and his wife Anne. Now exhausted with rearing so many children and suffering the grief of having lost no less than 13 of them, she, at the age, when Edward was four years old, decided that she just couldn't cope with him anymore. And she handed him over to his 26-year-old sister, also called Anne. And together they moved into separate accommodation away from the rest of the family. Now, although Anne proved to be a loving mother substitute who remained devoted to Lear for the rest of her life, he never got over the emotional injury inflicted by what he felt to be his mother's heartless rejection of him. And like so many children who have suffered maternal rejection, he felt it must be his fault, that there must be something wrong with him. And he never overcame feelings of personal unattractiveness. And his adult determination to make people laugh with his limericks and to charm them with his personality and his art may in part be seen as attempts to compensate for these crippling feelings of ugliness. 
His sister Anne seems to have been a vivacious and warm-hearted person, and certainly she did all she could to limit the damage caused by his mother's rejection and the misery caused by ill health. He was a sickly child. He suffered from epilepsy, bronchitis, asthma, and had periods of acute depression. There we go. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> Um, but because he was sickly he was never sent away to boarding school and, uh, and so he was spared the emotionally stultifying effects of a Victorian boarding school and was free to develop his, the imagination in fantasy in poetry and in art and he appreciated the importance of this because he always thanked God that he hadn't been educated Though there was, as we shall see, a downside to this because there was a sense in which he was never really initiated into society and he always felt himself to be something of an outsider. In addition to frequent epileptic fits, of which he was always deeply ashamed, he suffered all his life from what would nowadays be diagnosed as a severe body dysmorphic disorder. This is a, a kind of morbid obsession with one's physical appearance. And in Lear's case, it was the size of his nose. And this really badly affected him. It affected his social and his emotional development, and it militated against him ever finding a soulmate of either sex with whom he could enjoy a committed and wholly reciprocal relationship. Now, to find relief from this preoccupation with his nose, Edward Lear used the same strategy that he had used in coping with his hurt feelings over being called a dirty landscape painter. He went public with it. He published caricatures to il illustrate limericks about old men who were different from normal people on account of some physical peculiarity. His limericks compensated, you can see, say, for his deformity in such rhymes as the dong with the luminous nose or the old man on whose nose most birds of the air could repose. He laughed at himself and found relief from the pain that his deformity caused him. As he put it in one of his best-known poems, how pleasant to know Mr. Lear. His mind is concrete and fastidious. His nose is remarkably big. His visage is more or less hideous. His beard, it resembles a wig. It was as if he was saying to the world, I know you think I'm ugly, but at least I can make you laugh at my ugliness and I can make it acceptable to you. Now, this technique often worked, but only up to a point. His nonsense poems achieved great popularity, it's true, and in his lifetime brought him greater fame than his paintings. But although he succeeded in making millions laugh, feelings of despair seldom left him for long. One gets the feeling that, on the whole, he would have much preferred to remain invisible like his umbrageous umbrella maker, whose face nobody ever saw because it was always covered by his umbrella. It has to be admitted that Lear was not blessed with good looks, but neither was he as ugly as he felt, which is often the case with people suffering from this disorder. Indeed, judging from portraits, probably flattering, made by his friends, W.N. Marstrand, when Lear was 20 